All right, this is John Cole with OKRaw.com. Today with another exciting episode for you and one like no other. I mean, I've never been to a place like this before. Where we're at today is actually a kombucha nano brewery. Yes, a nano brewery. So that's like, not like a microbrewery. Some of those microbreweries are actually huge. This is actually much smaller. A family owned business. Uh, you know, I'm visiting Maui currently and I love visiting farmer's markets. The best farmer's market, you know, on Maui is the Upcountry Farmers Market near Kula on Saturdays. Definitely recommend you guys go there if you haven't already or if you're visiting Maui. And I ran into a whole bunch of different uh, vendors, both farmers and otherwise, that actually knew me. It was kind of cool because they watched my videos. So I got started talking to the kombucha uh, manufacturer there. And I said, hey, can I come down and do a video to share with my viewers about kombucha? Because there's a lot of things that are not known and you know facts that I want you guys to be aware about, whether you're growing your own, making your own kombucha, whether you're buying kombucha, there's some things that I believe you guys should know. And now I'm literally going to blow the lids off, you know, some of the things happen in the industry for you guys. And uh, where we're at today is actually, we're at the Awaken Tea Kombucha Company. And this is really cool because it's family owned business. And uh, you know, one of the things on the label here, it says fresh Lilikoi harvest ingredients, 100% organic raw kombucha culture, fresh pressed Lilikoi. You know, a lot of the kombuchas you guys may be buying in the store may not have fresh pressed juice. I mean, they get organic Lilikoi here, they juice them themselves, and that's the flavoring that's put into this kombucha. And even more so, we're gonna be able to show you guys the process. Here at Awaken Tea Kombucha, there's full transparency. You know, I was invited in and I really like this. I mean, I want you guys to support companies that have full transparency because there's so many things that happen behind the iron curtain that you guys are not aware of by just going to the store and buying a kombucha brand, whether you're here on Maui or whether you're anywhere else, you know, in the country. So after watching this episode, you're gonna know more about the process and more of the questions to ask kombucha manufacturers before you buy their product to make sure you get a good one. So anyways, I guess what I want to do next is actually go through the process or some of the process of making the kombucha to let you guys know how it's made. And then at the end, we're actually going to bring in uh, one of the master kombucha brewers and the owner uh, to share with you guys some answers to so some really important questions about, you know, how raw is kombucha, you know, really when it's brewed tea and they're saying raw on the package or the label. So I guess with that, let's go ahead and uh, start our tour here and show you guys how it's made. So the first step to making a good kombucha is of course using a good water. Now they only use a reverse osmosis system here to remove all the dissolved solids and all the minerals and all that stuff. So you're gonna get the best quality kombucha. I mean, if you guys brew your own coffee, right? You guys that are really coffee connoisseurs, you guys won't just use tap water to brew your coffee, right? You're gonna use a good filtered you know, reverse osmosis or distilled water even, and then brew your coffee into that because you're gonna get much better flavors. And that's why they're doing it here. In addition, depending on the water source and most kombucha brewers probably use municipal water source for the most part, you know, they may have uh, fluoride or uh, things like chlorine added. And that's why the reverse osmosis for the most part removes all those things so you don't have any contamination in the water and you're gonna end up with the highest quality product. So the next step of making a good kombucha is basically to make a nutrient solution that's gonna actually feed the kombucha scoby or the kombucha mother. And how they simply do that is they take some of the filtered reverse osmosis water here and they turn on the, um, the boiler there that boils the water and they dispense the water into the stainless steel uh, vessel <laughs> that they brew the nutrient solution, uh, which they're gonna add a few ingredients to. Now I want you guys to remember, you know, they're not just making a tea because whatever they're making in there is the nutrient solution. And what's gonna happen is the kombucha SCOBY is gonna convert all those nutrients in there, including the sugar and the tea into something entirely different. This is like if you guys ferment your vegetables and have eaten sauerkraut. You take cabbage and you make cabbage with the lack of bacillus and you make that into a sauerkraut and once you make the sauerkraut, right, it's no longer, you know, the cabbage. It's something different because it tastes totally different, right? And that's kind of what they're doing here. So they're filling up the water and now we're gonna go ahead and add the sugar and also the tea. So after we got the boiling water, the next step is to add the sugar 
and they're using an organic cane sugar here and once again this cane sugar will get metabolized by the kombucha culture so there'll be if done properly very little residual sugar in the final product now you know look out for places that say there's no sugar in there because if it tastes if there's no sugar in there then it would probably taste horrible the other thing that i have a big problem with in this day and age is you know uh, certain companies will put there's this much sugar and I know for a fact there's got to be more sugar than that. Now the other thing that they do is they're going to start adding some tea in but they first need to make sure the sugar is fully dissolved. Now if you guys want to make your own kombucha at home you know you're going to basically use a ratio one gallon of the water to one cup of sugar and then next we're going to go ahead and add the tea so once the sugar is dissolved into solution then the tea will be added and what's being added now is organic fair trade tea and for the home people out there wanting to brew themselves it's about uh five to six ounces of tea uh, per gallon of water so you know once again the recipe is one gallon of water about one cup of the sugar and five to six ounces of the tea all stirred up to create a, a sweet tea now i know some of you guys are thinking john i don't drink caffeine you know i know there's caffeine in the in the black tea so yes if you drank this it'd be like a sweet tea and many of you guys from the south like to drink sweet teas and yes there's caffeine and sugar in the sweet teas but the magic of the kombucha culture is that it basically takes the caffeine and the tea and the sugar and turns it into entirely something different. So, you know, the caffeine is basically uh, cultured out and eaten, for lack of a better word, by the culture because what it is is this. The teas have a high nitrogen level and the kombucha culture loves nitrogen. And the caffeinated tea is the highest in nitrogen. That basically is why this all works, you know, making the kombucha with the tea and the sugar. So now that the kombucha is brewing, in the vessel the stainless steel vessel that you guys saw the next step is to actually put it into one of the fermentation vessels and so uh, what Corey's is doing now is actually uh, cleaning out a previous fermentation vessel because another thing that's very important whether you're buying kombucha or whether you're making it yourself is sanitation and cleanliness and, you know if you're not sanitary I mean he's wearing gloves here he's being very careful uh, you know not to bring and introduce different bacteria, dirt, and all this kind of stuff to the culture because that may, you know, uh, mess it up. So he's cleaning out the fermentation vessel that he'll be now brewing the new uh, tea in. And more importantly, I want to talk about the fermentation vessels that he's using, right? Uh, here they use uh, stainless steel fermentation vessels made in Italy. So this is of the highest quality uh, stainless steel. You know, there's a lot of stainless steel coming out of China and I kind of wonder if that's really all stainless steel. And uh, you know, some uh, fermenters may use uh, plastic or other materials. And if you guys are brewing at home, I would definitely recommend something like uh, uh, something solid, right? Something like uh, glass or some stoneware that has a finish on it or something like uh, stainless steel and not use plastic because think about it you know while the kombucha is fermenting it's acidic and you know acids will leach things out of plastic so if you are also buying kombucha you may also want to ask you know the person making the kombucha hey what are you guys fermenting because the kombucha is sitting in there for you know you know up to two weeks and depends on the climate could be less could be more and they do they do full run batches here so they do a batch type kombucha which is the kind i prefer to drink and i would recommend that's the kind you would want to drink too for a few reasons because there's continuous kombucha and batch kombucha the batch kombucha basically they run the batch in here until it's fully fermented you know the sugars are at the lowest point the caffeine is fermented out of the mixture and then that's when they bottle it and sell it to you guys now in a continuous uh, process kombucha you know they don't have to clean the vessels out so this is more labor intensive what they do here but basically they're just adding fresh sugarized and caffeinated tea in and then harvesting that as they go so they have a lot more you know caffeine potentially and sugar in the mixture so now that the stainless steel fermentation vessel has been cleaned and sterilized we're now going to take the tea that's been brewing and has had time to cool down properly and uh, basically put that into the fermentation vessel. 
Got a nice uh, stream going on right there. And now while this is happening, I want to let you guys know it's very important to cool down your tea properly because you do not want to brew your kombucha when it's too hot. You're going to burn the culture, right? Uh, the optimal temperature for kombucha when brewing is between 75 to 85 degrees and at hotter temperatures it can happen faster. So you know if you're in a colder temperature, right, it's going to take longer for your kombucha to fully ferment to get out that caffeine and get out that sugar and you know that's one of the goals that they're doing here. So the next step that's happening now is actually the uh, tea that was freshly brewed or what I would like to term as the nutrient solution because that's what's really feeding the kombucha culture in there. Uh, they need to add the starter tea and what the starter tea is, it's actually um, a fully uh, fermented kombucha that has been completed its whole cycle. So it got, you know, like all the sugar out and the caffeine out and what it helps to do is actually it helps jumpstart the newly brewed tea, number one, and more importantly, number two, it um, helps to keep out the unwanted bacteria and other potential pathogens like mold that can grow by lowering uh, the pH in there. So uh, yeah, it looks like it's all filled up and I think we're gonna start to brew baby brew. So the next step after putting in the starter culture to once again get the pH correct and a finished kombucha should be a pH range between like 2.8 to 3.2 which is an acid range and once again this is to uh, prohibit the occurrence of uh, you know microbes and molds and all this kind of stuff like undesirable ones and the thing is I know you guys might be thinking John Kombucha is acidic and if you've watched me for any length of time you know that I recommend an alkaline based diet and we want to be alkaline a problem in my opinion with most Americans today they're eating a very acidic diet including things like animal products very acidifying on your body and we want to have an alkaline condition and the thing to know is like lemons for example we'll just give you this quick analogy lemons are acidic when you eat them right they're highly acidic but overall they're alkalinizing to your body and you know that's the same thing with the kombucha you know it's alkalinizing so it's actually a good thing now do I recommend drinking kombucha each and every day because it's alkalinizing well we'll talk about that at the end of the video but uh, what they did just now is actually transferred the kombucha mother over into the new batch the starter tea alone is not enough to get this to ferment properly and so you will need a mother culture and one of the cool things I learned is that you could actually eat your mother culture if you're cannibal wait no you wouldn't be a cannibal because you're eating a mother culture and I heard it doesn't taste like anything so one day I hope to uh, dry and freeze dry and flavor some mother culture to see what it's tasting like because I'm sure it's definitely rich in benefits much like the kombucha of course the final step after adding the mother culture is uh, they're basically putting a cloth over the top so the kombucha can breathe but yet no dirt dust or other foreign particulates will get into the mixture so now that we got the freshly brewed tea or the nutrient solution added with the starter culture then the mother went in and this is pretty much how it looks now I want you guys to pay attention I mean this kombucha mother that's a model kombucha mother I mean it's a supermodel kombucha mother this thing's hot look at that curve the curves on the kombucha but in any case this one actually looks pretty nice and all kombucha mothers will look a little bit different I mean some if there's a lot of co2 in the kombucha they might look kind of dis disformed and all this stuff but they're still gonna be all right normally they actually don't open up the kombucha mothers you know and expose it to air like this but I'm doing it for you guys for the video so you guys can see what it actually looks like uh, we're gonna go ahead and put the top back on and we're gonna share with you guys actually the way they test you know the every brew while it's fermenting uh, up next and it's gonna be fun for me all right so here's something really cool that I want to do for you guys to show you guys the differences between the sweet tea and the mixture that goes in versus the kombucha that comes out because there is a big difference so this is the one that was actually just filled you guys saw Corey in the background filled with all the stuff he did and uh, we're gonna go ahead and tap out a little bit just to show you guys the color yeah, that kind of looks like pee <laughs> so this stuff is actually uh, nice and uh, yellow fairly dark now we're gonna go ahead and transition over to one that's actually been brewing for the appropriate amount of time so now we have pretty much a finished batch that they were bottling earlier today here at awaken tea kombucha 
that's totally finished. And you know, once again, here's that one that we just bottled up. Looks like the P. <laughs> and uh, now we're gonna go ahead and tap off the finished one. Wow, look at that, man. It's like a little bit fizzy in there. And uh, you know, here's the difference. Look at the difference on that. Big significant difference, right? Which one would you rather drink, right? Do you wanna drink the P <laughs> with the sugar and with the caffeine, or do you wanna drink the finished kombucha? You know, the finished kombucha, it has different properties than the tea that's brewed in because literally the kombucha mother that you saw that big blob on the top, you know, basically digests and feeds off the nitrogen, feeds off the caffeine, feeds off the sugars and converts it into something entirely different. This has two different strains of probiotics in there. In addition, it has live enzymes provided you have a raw kombucha like they're uh, producing here and it's not been pasteurized. Uh, it also has B vitamins. It also has beneficial yeasts, which we'll talk more about in just a little bit. It also has different kinds of acids, such as of course, amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, lactic acid, gluconic acid. I mean, this stuff is really healthy and good for you. And the way I like to use kombucha, once again, you know, I like to use it as a supplement. You know, I'd much rather drink a kombucha than take, you know, white powder, you know, capsules for my beneficial probiotics because this is more of a real whole food. It also has a whole spectrum of nutrients besides just the you know beneficial uh, bacteria it also has beneficial yeasts as well as the b vitamins all right let's go ahead and taste this original unflavored version of the kombucha that they offer here mm. i taste very little sweetness i taste the tartness you know of some of that tea but you know normally they don't sell it like the original flavor they actually flavor it up and that's one of the cool things they're doing here they're creating all kinds of unique flavors using local ingredients to basically make this taste better but also add additional nutrients now one of the things that many kombucha brewers do is they actually add flavors before they brew the tea and then the flavoring is actually brewing in there they make a uh, unflavored tea and then add the flavors after which in my opinion is a much more beneficial way to do it because now you're actually culturing the sugars and not the fruit sugars or the other flavoring agents and you're going to get undiluted basically flavors and nutrients in the final end product so let's see how they make and use natural ingredients to make some of the flavors they offer here at awaken tea kombucha so next, I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys actually how they add the flavoring into the Awake Tea Kombucha. And you know, this is one of the reasons why I'm here today because all kombucha makers do not do their flavorings like this. You know, they custom blend all their own flavorings using many actually using local Maui grown organic ingredients. Actually, all their kombuchas are all organic ingredients. Um, the one I'm gonna to try to model, which I don't know the exact proportions of, is uh, they have a green blend, which is, you know, the green blend kombuchas are my favorite ones by far to drink because they have greens in there as well as things like uh, algae powders, which I believe are definitely beneficial. In the green uh, kombucha here, they put simply basil and mint to get some nice flavor overtones and they can't just put whole leaves of basil and mint. What they do instead is actually they juice it on up and this is unlike many other kombucha companies. Many other kombucha companies may add flavor agents, whether that's uh, extracts or concentrates or you know artificial coloring and, and dyes and natural flavorings, all these things that you know that I would not necessarily recommend you guys consume. And that's why I like what they do here because they use uh, you know fresh ingredients whenever possible and also other organic spices. You know, instead of using extracts and flavors you know recently i was actually in texas and i got some root beer flavored kombucha you know go figure that one out um and yeah i mean it tasted good but you know optimally i want to encourage you guys no matter you're drinking kombucha or eating anything read the ingredient labels and if it's things that you can't pronounce in there and natural flavors and things that aren't exactly telling you what's in there don't drink it i mean on the bottle here one of the things i like is actually they're using glass bottles that are reusable uh, you know, so you put a ball to the deposit and then you could reuse 
the bottle. They're from Italy, very high quality. They go through a very strict sanitation process, which I have observed how they do it. And I could uh, vouch that these are definitely clean bottles that they get done with them. They list the ingredients and the ingredients aren't hidden in small letters on the back of the bottle like many brands. It's up front and in the center for you guys to know what's in there because the Awakened Tea Kombucha wants to be transparent and that's why they're literally allowing me in their facility today to share with you guys literally how their stuff is made so you guys know how it's made and there's no trade secrets here like in many other kombucha companies you know, out in the world. So yeah, the ingredients simply in this is 100% organic raw kombucha culture, which you guys show, you guys saw how it's brewed. Uh, Maui grown basil, Maui grown mint, and Klamath Lake blue green algae. And of course, pure joy. Well, I'm gonna add pure love instead of pure joy so the ingredient level is wrong for this bottle. So anyways, uh, let's go ahead and uh, get juicing. We're gonna turn uh, this uh, single auger slow juicer down. If you don't yet have a juicer, I definitely recommend uh, getting a juicer. Uh, basically what the juicer does, it separates the juice from the fiber and Jake Cordage told me it's the juice of the fiber that feeds you. So we're going to stick in some uh, Maui grown organic fresh basil, get this juice right up and we're also going to go ahead and uh, throw in some fresh mint in there and we're going to juice a bunch of this. Now they have specific recipes, I mean they have a big R&D, you know, as research and development where they do trial and error and test all kinds of flavors. They always have seasonal flavors one of my favorite seasonal flavors that i've tasted for the first time actually is lilikoi or passion fruit uh, kombucha that they have that i got to sample out at the farmer's market i'm gonna go ahead and uh, jam some more of that basil in there and yeah i mean freshest is always best this is what i want to encourage you guys to do now yes definitely while i would rather any day of the week encourage you guys to drink a fresh juice you know made in your own juicer rather than a kombucha you know i want you guys to think in terms of good better best i know many of you guys out there may be maybe still be drinking soft drinks right and definitely in my opinion better than soft drinks is kombucha because that's moving you in the right direction now of course better than kombucha in my opinion are green juices and i like to drink green juices and fresh fruit juices you know several times during the week especially if i'm home it's almost every day but if i'm traveling you know hey i'll grab a kombucha because that's one of the best beverages i could be drinking and i look at kombucha more as a supplement than a drink i know some of you guys are maybe buying cases of kombucha at a time and slamming down but i mean really you know i like to think of uh, food as medicine you know like hippocrates the great hippocrates said you know let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food and in the same respect you know some foods to me our foods like fresh fruits and vegetables those are foods i'll eat in large quantities and things like garlic you know yes while garlic is a food i like to use it only for flavoring and more as a medicine so i'm not eating tons of garlic but i'm eating a little bit here and there because i do believe it has beneficial properties and likewise i believe kombucha also has some beneficial properties and should be enjoyed you know sometimes uh you know when you feel like it all right so we're pretty much done i think juicing up some basil and the mint there and man this juicer is doing an amazing job this is an omega a horizontal auger juicer uh, they are available at discountjuicers.com if you need to buy a juicer we're going to go ahead and turn this baby off and uh, as you guys can see we got our basil mint juice and now what we're going to do is actually besides the basil and the mint maui grown they also got some uh, blue green algae and that's this already in here blue green algae so we're gonna go ahead and add our basil mint and look at this texture on that I mean these are the fresh ingredients that they use to make their own green kombucha now we're just gonna go ahead and simply pour this in and you know I want to let you guys know that not all kombuchas are made in this way many of them you know once again may have flavoring agents added uh, previous to uh, bottling and I really like the way that they're doing it here is by literally adding the fresh ingredients at, in the bottom of the bottle whether that's one of their uh, hibiscus or ginger or seasonal uh, lilikoi passion fruit flavors or the green one I tend to prefer you know green kombuchas over the others so now that we got this mixture in the bottle let's go back uh, and uh, fill up this bottle with the 100% raw live 
kombucha. So now I'm gonna add the 100% traditionally fermented kombucha culture into my green goodness uh, flavoring that's there on the bottom. And we're just gonna go ahead and tap this baby off and check it out. Look at that guy fill up. Right into the bottle. This is how they fill their very bottles here at their production facility. So as this guy fills up, we're gonna wanna shut it off so that it doesn't get too tall. Whoa. And uh, you know, then they basically, uh, to finish off the process, they basically cap this guy off and then they refrigerate it. And the cool thing is, is uh, kombucha can stay refrigerated. And what happens is literally it just slows down the fermentation almost to its screeching halt. So, you know, basically you could store it indefinitely Usually in my house, it just definitely doesn't last that long. So now we're gonna get to try this uh, green goodness that I made <laughs> with my own two hands. Wow. I really taste the basil and the mint, and I personally just love the blue-green algae. I mean, there's definitely so many benefits to the blue-green algae. One of them is that it's one of the highest sources of protein on the entire planet. I mean, think about where fish gets its protein, right? It's from the algae in the ocean, right? And that's in addition to the nutrients in the kombucha, such as B vitamins, amino acids, lactic acid, of course, amino acids, as well as, more importantly for me, the beneficial probiotics and the beneficial yeasts, and of course, the enzymes in this live raw kombucha makes this kombucha truly a superfood in my opinion. Now the last part of this episode is probably the part that you're really going to want to stay tuned for. I'm going to now get to talk to Corey, the master kombucha uh, brewer here and owner of the company. We're going to ask him some in-depth questions about kombucha, his kombucha and other kombuchas and things you will want to look for when buying your own kombucha in the store. So now I'm here with Corey, the brewmaster, and one of the owners of this family-owned business. Corey and his wife, Tiffany, are the owners, and that's one of the things I wanna encourage you guys to always support local you know, companies whenever you can buying kombucha, because in my opinion, you know, if you're distributing in a local area, you're making it locally, in many cases, but not all cases, it's gonna be a lot higher quality and you're gonna have the craftsmanship that they can't get in national distributed brands. Next, we're gonna go ask uh, Corey some important questions about kombucha since he has been drinking and making his own kombucha for the last 12 years. So Corey, the first question I wanna ask you is, you know, for the viewers that don't exactly know what kombucha is, what is kombucha anyways? Kombucha is, in its simplest definition, a fermented tea. Um, it originated in uh, parts of China and Russia. And so the kombucha is referencing the type of culture that you're fermenting with and you're feeding it the tea and the sugar. Okay, so I know, I mean, I covered this early in the video, but in case you guys missed it, is there sugar in the final product and is there caffeine in the final product? So um, there isn't a straightforward answer with that because it's all dependent on the person that's making it um, or the manufacturer that is making it for you. Um, for us, we've always strived to produce a kombucha that is very low in sugar residuals. And um, the other thing is for me personally, I can't do caffeine anymore at all in my diet. So, um, and the same has gone, gone for my wife as well. So for us in our product, what we give to our customers is there are very trace amounts of caffeine that's, that's left and very low sugar residuals. So here's another question, uh, Corey. Do you need to add the sugars to make the kombucha? Could you do it sugar-free or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the things John was talking about in the video is that um, the, the sugar and the tea make up the nutrient solution. So um, there are some other substitutes that you could use like, uh, like honey, for example, some home brewers that you know, might have access to you know, locally made honey, but uh, you don't wanna use raw honey, for example, because you're introducing other um, wild bacteria strains that um, are gonna battle with the kombucha. So we use an organic, cane sugar in all of our kombucha batches um, but 
stevia or some other um, you know sweetener substitute would not be acceptable because it's not a fermentable sugar. So another question I have for you, Corey, you know, this has been on my mind so much because, you know, you hear, you hear about the kombucha scoby or the kombucha mother or the kombucha culture, whatever you want to call it. You know, some people say it's a bacteria, some people say it's a fungus, and some people say it's a mushroom, some people say, some people don't know what it is. So what, from a, you know, 12 plus year brewer and drinker yourself, what is it, man? What is it? <laughs> you know, technically the closest relative that the kombucha culture has to is a lichen. Oh. So it's it's kind of, you know, in a little bit of a unique family of its own. The acronym for SCOBY that we say is a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast. So, you know, a lot of people we will say like, you know, it's a mushroom. Um, some people refer to it just as a UFO because <laughs> it has this very unidentifiable floating object, um, you know, that, that sits on the surface. But, you know, the, the science tells us that it's closest related to a, a lichen, if that means anything to you. So the next question I have for you, Corey, is uh, why did you start to drink kombucha in the first place? The, the first introduction I had to it was living in Alaska and I came from a coffee culture growing up in the Pacific Northwest. I would yearn for that cup of coffee first thing in the morning and it really never satisfied me because I would get these jitters and to this day um, I have pretty much stepped completely away from caffeine altogether because it um, fed my anxiety and panic attacks that I had. So I had to steer away from that altogether. But it really was how the clarity that I had when I first would drink it in the morning was a better feeling than I'd had from any cup of coffee. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I definitely want to encourage you guys to get off the coffee. I don't do not think it's a good thing. It has a caffeine. And once again, while they are using, you know, the tea leaves, in the kombucha that does have the caffeine is basically eaten up by the kombucha culture and then you're getting some of the beneficial antioxidant properties of that green tea so the next question i have for you corey is why did you end up starting the kombucha business to you know bring this and share this kombucha with the community so one of our values in our company is that we're community driven and so when we had an idea of manufacturing food, there's a lot of responsibility we feel like that goes with putting you know, food out into the public. And when we looked at the kombucha industry, at least locally, it was, it was very lacking and there um, really was only a few national brands that were even available at all. And we felt like there was just a real void in what people had as an option to drink kombucha. And what there was, we felt like people were just kind of getting shortchanged. We, we really wanted to provide a product that could find that balance of being very nutrient dense and beneficial while maintaining a great and fun flavor profile. So Corey, what are some of the health benefits of the kombucha? So the quick breakdown of what we communicate to our customers is because people ask us all the time like what is kombucha and why do i need it um, there are a couple strains of probiotics so it is a great supplement if you're wanting additional probiotics in your diet but one of the most unique things that i try to let people know is that there's a long list of healthy acids that we don't get in the foods that we that we really eat it's not stuff that our body readily produces um, and John had touched on it earlier, like the amino acids that are the building blocks of, of proteins that help us, you know, rebuild, um, you know, muscle tissues and things like that. There's lactic acid, uh, which helps prevent the growth of bad bacteria. Um, there's acetic acid and gluconic acid, both of which really help neutralize pH. Um, you had also talked about earlier, you know, living um, a life where you're eating foods that um, are alkalizing to the, to the body and so we love breaking that misconception because kombucha is 
technically an acidic beverage, um, but those healthy acids that are in it really help alkalize and, and neutralize um, your pH. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I like to drink kombucha sometimes, especially because it's alkalizing, and that's just one of the reasons, you know, that I like to drink kombucha personally. Another reason, of course, is the beneficial probiotics and also beneficial yeast. So let's talk about that, Corey. You know, I know some people out there watching this may have candida issues and they're scared of kombucha, man, because if I drink it, I'm going to get more candida outgrowth. So tell me what you know about the, the yeast and will drinking kombucha promote more candidiasis, candidiasis, whatever it is. <laughs> So we do get that question a lot um, because there is sugar in kombucha and for those that have suffered from candida, that's generally the first thing that you know their doctor or their um, naturopath will tell them like avoid all sugars and it's right like candida is basically an imbalance of unhealthy yeast in the, in the, in the system and so um, you know, does kombucha feed that and help, you know, explode, you know, all those unhealthy yeasts? Well, again, it really depends on how much sugar might be left over in the kombucha and it's dependent on a lot of factors and, and who is making who is making it. Um, so one of our struggles is, you know, every batch of kombucha is going to be slightly different. It's a natural fermentation process and there are some things you know as it's a craft that i've developed you know in my 10 years plus of brewing where we try to get as consistent of a product as possible and still have you know tasty flavors with low sugar residuals but um you know there are other beneficial yeasts that are in kombucha that will actually help go up against things like candida I mean, I would definitely agree based on the research I've done about probiotics, which include not only healthy bacteria, which is often talked about, there's also healthy yeasts. And we need to have this balance in our gut because based on my research, once again, you know, they play a significant portion and part in our immune system, but more importantly, in our digestion. So the next question I have for you, uh, Corey, is are all kombuchas created equal? Because you're talking about sugar content and I... I mean, I've tried many kombuchas, you know, all over the place when I've traveled here, when I went to trade shows and, you know, things and companies have their kombucha, I've tried them and yours is one of the lowest in sugar that I've tasted also. It's one of the best tasting as well, but are all kombuchas created equal? Um, I mean, I think the, the simple answer is, is no. Just as we look at anything in the food industry is, you know, an orange juice concentrate that's, you know, in the freezer section the same as something that you just you know pressed fresh right. and the obvious answer is is no uh, you know we are really proud to be part of a vastly growing kombucha industry and um, we're one of the founding members along with about 50 other kombucha companies that have joined um, in a new trade group called kombucha brewers international and one of the goals that the, the group has is to start creating some kind of independent um, certification process that, because as a consumer, it's really hard to have discernment when you walk into the store and to know, you know who has um, any kind of transparency with what ingredients and what processes they're really using to produce the drink that you're about to, to consume. Wow, I mean, you guys saw it here. I mean, full transparency here at Awaken Tea Kombucha, and I was glad to be able to share that with you. So the next question I have for you, Corey, is, you know, I know there's no such thing as raw food labeling laws, and I mean, there's a lot of words you can use on labels where there's no legal definition, so you can't get sued or shut down or anything for saying things like natural, saying things like raw, and a lot of raw food products aren't even raw these days. But I know on your label you put raw and I feel your product isn't a live product because it has active cultures in it. You know, let's talk about raw and live kombucha and are there some kombuchas out there on the market that may not actually be raw and live and you know, what are the implications of this? Well, the, the distinct uh, definition of what would, I would think is a raw kombucha is, is one that has really no post processing. So, uh, meaning 
like pasteurization would be one one method that a manufacturer may use that um, can it could be a, a way for them to get more consistency but also for them to increase shelf life so when you're a major manufacturer you start working with nationwide distributors and shelf life becomes much more of an of an issue so you know as a raw kombucha manufacturer like yes we do steep the tea and the sugar goes through you know its process to become um, you know crystallized organic cane sugar but the actual brewing process um, that we go through as John was showing earlier through the fermentation is that it really is still a a raw product there's no pasteurization that uh, that we do to control that so Corey next I want to talk more about the kombucha as uh, you know a, a beverage that somebody drinks instead of a coke or maybe as instead how I view it as a supplement that I take very irregularly and when I think my body needs it yeah so without a good whole foods diet um, you know if you're just to focus like you think that kombucha is good for you and it is but is it going to become your you know your primary food just because one thing is really good for you no like kombucha is a great supplement to any diet because it's going to help your body do what it's supposed to do which is eat whole foods <laughs> <laughs> so you know as far as when people first try our product they ask how much do I need to drink well how much you need to drink is there's a lot of variables and you know we try to lean on the cautious side by telling people to you know introduce your body to the product in you know stages try drinking a four to eight ounce serving first thing in the morning which was how I was introduced to it and it made a really big difference and so you know there are some people we have customers that swear by how amazing they feel after drinking an entire 36 ounce <laughs> bottle. Um, you know, I'm not gonna argue with them, but you know, I, I definitely wanna make sure that people are following up with drinking kombucha um, with some good purified water because of all the, you know, the, the nutrient density and how the body is detoxifying. You wanna make sure that you're, you know, having a good healthy diet and drinking plenty of water in addition to it. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely want to encourage you guys to eat a healthy diet no matter what you're on. And if you're not already, check out my other videos and subscribe to my YouTube channel where I teach my specific kind of healthy diet, which I've been researching now for the last 19 years and been doing it. It's definitely working for me. And I believe, once again, you know, kombucha is a great supplement to my already, you know, whole foods, plant-based diet. All right, Corey, so the next question I have for you is, Let's talk about the fizz in the kombucha. You know, I know some of you guys may be buying bottled kombuchas at the store and they seem to be very fizzy. And you know, like the kombucha I tried here is actually pretty low on the fizz count, the fresh, freshly bottled stuff that you guys saw me bottle up and even, you know, take a drink out of. So let's, let's talk about that. Do, do some companies add carbonation to their kombuchas and is this natural and, and do you do it here? Uh, our bottled kombucha, we try to keep the most traditional um, you know carbonation is certainly a cultural thing in the United States we have uh, this fixation or this <laughs> obsession with bubbles in our drink if you go other places in the world um, you know fizzy water would be appalling and so you know it's really it becomes a preference and so um, we've seen that trend in kombucha manufacturing that is you know producing a, a really fizzy kombucha there are a couple ways that you can get uh, extra extra bubbles and there is a mild amount of carbonation just in that initial fermentation process but the things that other manufacturers are doing and it's you know it's a choice it's something that I think a lot of consumers want that maybe be you know they're coming from a background of drinking soda daily so they're used to all that carbonation but um, you know, forced carbonation is a method where you're adding food grade carbon dioxide into the liquid and so you're, you're getting extra bubbles that way. So virtually any kombucha that's sold on tap 
um, including our kombucha is the carbon dioxide is blending with the liquid and it's going to create you know more or less an artificial fizz to it um, the other way that you you might get additional carbonation is a method that we personally don't practice but it's called uh, secondary fermentation or or bottle fermentation and that's where you know you'll take the the kombucha you'll put it in the bottle and you might add some more fruit juice that has additional sugars and those sugars are going to convert um, and they're going to continue to ferment at room temperature you're going to create you know more bubbles that that way and you know the hard thing for us as a commercial manufacturer is that it's really hard to control what the alcohol levels do at that secondary fermentation just because you're adding more sugars and there's already an abundance of those healthy yeasts so you know our bottled product we definitely try to just keep it as natural as possible um, and then we do some things with our kombucha on tap to try to minimize the amount of forced carbonation but absolutely kombucha on tap will have some some forced carbonation with that method sure so i mean i want to encourage you guys to drink a low carbonated kombucha i think it's just healthier because we don't need we don't have a requirement for drinking extra co2 <laughs> and i actually I like the really mellow stuff that they actually uh, in their standard bottled uh, process the next question i want to ask you corey is regarding the organic so i know you i mean you guys um, use organic ingredients, some fair trade ingredients. Uh, you know, tell me more about your uh, choice to do this. Well, there's, as a manufacturer, there's certainly like, you know, we're a, a family owned business that uh, it's certainly challenging when you're looking at your food costs and to stay in operation. But one of our passions and the things that we were dedicated to in the beginning was finding the absolute best ingredients that we can while supporting a fair trade industry. Now, you know, we come from a place where there's an abundance of things that are farmed right here on our island. We wish that, um, you know, there was a tea industry that <laughs> could be supported, but um, at minimum, you know, we want to buy uh, organic teas that have a fair trade certificate just because, you know, that's what we feel is our responsibility to the industry that that we're in. So besides using organic ingredients, the Awaken Tea Kombucha Company also is a sustainable company and it's probably one of the most sustainable kombucha companies I've ever seen. They not only use the reusable bottles that you guys saw earlier, they also have actually reusable labels on their bottles that they reuse time after time. So Corey, what's the decision behind the whole sustainability of your company? Why do you do that? For us living on Maui, we have to import v virtually everything that goes into our manufacturing. So the glass bottles, if we're gonna have to import it, we wanna make sure that they're a quality vessel that is not only going to display our product its best, but also be durable and be able to be rewashed and reused o over and over. Uh, we are, according to our state health department, we are one of the only companies in the whole state of Hawaii that has any reusable bottle program, <laughs> which is kind of hard to believe, but we had to convince them that we could go through a multi-step process of removing food residual, sanitizing the bottles, um, and presenting them as new when we go to our packaging. The, the labels that we use was just on the same topic. You know, we wanna have something that is still gonna look good and display our brand, but is something that can be used over and over. So the labels, you know, they cost us more upfront, but if we're able to reuse them over and over again, then for us, you know, it's, it's worth it. I would always encourage you guys out there to reuse instead of recycle, no matter what you're bringing into your home and you're buying you know, to reuse it before you ever recycle. And I'm glad, I mean, that's literally what they're doing here. So one of the techniques that I got to share with you guys earlier on how they produce the kombucha here is that they use a batch technique, but besides just a standard batch technique, there's also a continuous uh, technique of manufacturing or making the kombucha. So Corey, do you wanna explain some of the differences between the two techniques and maybe you know why one might wanna choose one over the other one? So we use a, a batch fermentation technique, which 
is more of a traditional approach to, to kombucha. And the reason is that when you're putting in your nutrient solution of sugar and tea, is that you're giving that whole batch an entire cycle, a time to, for, for the kombucha to absorb and metabolize everything in it. So you're basically getting a more consistent batch when you're all done. Most of the sugars are gonna be absorbed if you're doing it properly. And uh, as well, the caffeine should be eaten up. Now, in a continuous brew situation where a lot of home brewers adopt this method and it's something that I just try to educate people on the, di the difference in it because a continuous brew is basically, say you have a, a two gallon batch that you're brewing at home and you bottle a gallon and then you replace that gallon with your sweet tea or your, your nutrient solution. Um, that sweet tea is then going to ferment quicker with the more acidic already fermented kombucha and so you'll have ready to drink kombucha quicker but there's within the batch that you've now created there's going to be different levels and so it kind of becomes a, a completely different method to, to fermenting that's really hard to get a consistent approach I know for home brewers um, it's become a very popular method just because of its convenience uh, because you can have a vessel that has a spout and you can just draw your bottles out and replace it so you kind of always have kombucha on demand but for us um, and for our consistency the batch is a little bit more work mm -hmm. but we get the most consistent results yeah i mean i definitely want to encourage you guys to do the batch method because we want to burn off all that sugar you know i'm not a fan of using any refined sugar products i mean of course i like here in hawaii drinking the sugar cane juice which is basically fresh sugar cane juiced all raw and that stuff ferments actually quite quickly if you leave it even sitting out i mean even if you buy it and you leave it sitting for like four days it's gone bad already because it's already starting to ferment so but yeah once the refined sugar in the kombucha is fully fermented like they do here you know i don't have a super huge problem drinking it you know especially because for me the, the kombucha especially the way it's produced here has some beneficial you know effects that of course i desire so the next question i have for you corey is you know um why does every batch of kombucha taste a little bit different i know some of you guys out there have bought in the same brand whether it's this brand or that brand you get the same brand same flavor and sometimes it tastes more fizzy less fizzy more sweet less sweet you know a little bit different i mean what's up with that <laughs> so obviously kombucha is it's a natural fermented product and so you know with every batch that we have here there's going to be slightly different uh, levels of bacteria and yeast and even you know just a couple degree temperature difference can play a role in what the the final output is going and you know there's a over you know a hundred years of documented research on kombucha and it's you know proper techniques of brewing and and we hear that all the time in our in our textbooks in our in our research is that you know there's I personally would be kind of skeptical if someone is providing a, a bottle of kombucha that is nearly exactly the same every time cool so let's talk about that because I know on some bottles of kombuchas in the back everybody always like is is taught to read ingredient labels and one of the things I want to teach you guys is to eat foods that don't have ingredient labels because we want to eat whole real foods that i mean an apple does not need an ingredient label a, co a whole coconut does not need an ingredient label yet you know bottled coconut water in a package needs an ingredient label right so eat things without ingredient labels but yet on some bottle of kombucha because you said there's a lot of variability you know you guys look at the sugars because we're taught sugar's bad but on some bottles of kombucha it's always the sugars are exactly the same now do you think this is accurate? And uh, I don't know, what are your just comments on that in general? Uh, I mean, my comments in general are that the, there's gotta be, there's, I think the FDA has a pretty impossible task of enforcing label laws. So as a consumer, one of the things we really try to empower people to do is if you have the ability to know your food manufacturer, mm and they're open enough that they can receive a phone call and answer some simple questions, then it really can be this 
this line of communication that you deserve to have and knowing what goes into your product. The difficult thing and it's, you know, with kombucha is that sugar levels can vary slightly from, from batch to batch. Um, does that mean that because there's, you know, a nutrient fact label on your bottle of whatever brand of kombucha that, um, you know, that they're lying to you? No, it doesn't necessarily mean that, but if you really want to know, then, you know, make a phone call or make an email to, you know, ask some simple questions. And usually the response that you'll get from a manufacturer will quickly let you know, you know, whether they're going to be transparent with their <laughs> consumers or whether they just don't want you to know. And that's not unique to kombucha, <laughs> but it's really, you know, to the whole food industry itself. So Corey, I mean, I would probably definitely agree with you on that. And I want to encourage you guys to, you know, trust your own senses. I mean, if you taste a kombucha and it tastes sweet and they're saying there's like one gram of sugar in there, something's probably up. You know, I mean, I tasted the kombucha here and it's one of the most non-sweet uh, kombuchas that I've tasted. So the next question I want to ask you, Corey, I mean, this is everybody out there could benefit from this question is what should somebody look for when buying a kombucha? So there are so many different methods that you can ferment something and call it kombucha. And as I mentioned earlier, one of our goals with Kombucha Brewers International is to find some regulation and a way of, you know, so that you can go into a store and, you know, look at something and know that at least it's gone through some kind of, you know, process to mm -hmm. get a certification. Um, you know, if you look on their website and you see lots of fancy, you know, models that are on a beach um, <laughs> laying it out, they're probably pouring a lot more money into their marketing campaign than they are their research and development uh, department. That's just kind of an opinion um, as a kombucha consumer long before, you know, we started our business. But um, there are some trends that we're seeing in the industry that um, it is a, it's, we're seeing a, a very fast growing trend in our, in our segment as kombucha has just sort of exploded in the United States in the last five years. Awesome. So, yeah, I mean, I always want to encourage you guys to, you know, support local brands and get to know them and ask them questions and even ask to come out to their place. Now, if you ask Corey, he probably won't let you come out. He'll say, watch John's video. <laughs> but other places, you know, I want, you know, you guys to be aware and, ha and companies have transparency because if they don't, if they're hiding things and they're not wanting to let you, you know, have be transparent, then they're probably got something to hide. And, you know, I just personally don't think uh, you know, that's super cool. You know, I want to encourage you guys to always uh, source local products whenever available instead of, you know, big national brands because, you know, I want you guys to support your local economy and I want you guys more importantly to vote with your dollars. I mean, I found Corey at the local, you know, uh, farmer's market and I want to encourage you guys to shop at your local farmer's markets and support companies, you know, who are there and farmers who are there. So the last question I want to ask for you, or one of the last questions, Corey, is, you know, uh, we've talked to you guys about what you should look for when buying kombucha, but even better yet than buying is making your own. I mean, I want to encourage you guys out there, instead of buying your food, grow your own food. And actually, I teach you guys how to do that if you're not aware of this at growingyourgreens.com. I have over a thousand videos now teaching you guys how to grow your own food. And uh, so, Corey, I want to ask you, you know, is it is it hard to make your own kombucha or is it easy? And can somebody out there watching and do it? Yeah, so we get that question a lot, um, even at our, our farmer's market. And although our business isn't currently in a situation where we can, um, you know, support teaching people how to make kombucha, we absolutely encourage our customers to make it. Now, is it easy and should everyone do it? <laughs> it's more like asking, like, should everyone have kids? <laughs> <laughs> Some people should not have kids. <laughs> trust me. I'll stop at that. Because I, I do, people ask me and I say that, you know, making your own kombucha is a lot like having a small child. And, you know, they constantly need to be tended to. You have to feed them. Um, you have to keep them you know, within a certain temperature range, meaning that you need to give them, you know, a roof over their head. But, um, but there's a lot of resources out there. And, you know, one of our goals, although we're not teaching people how to make kombucha right now, 
um, is to, we would love to direct people to the reputable resources. Obviously, if you Google, you know, how to make kombucha, you're gonna get a lot of pages about it. And the fear that we have is that, you know, you're gonna end up on the wrong page with the wrong information and be doing something that you really shouldn't be doing in your kitchen and then, you know, endorsing it either with a bad endorsement because you had a bad experience or drinking something that really doesn't have any great benefit to your health. Wow, I mean, just watching this video, you guys know more than what most people know about kombucha, unless you're a kombucha expert watching this. Because um, I literally went through the process on how they do it, gave some overall general ratios, and the whole process they go through, I mean, one of my reasons for doing this is that so that you can empower yourselves to at least know the process so that when you go to a website and look you know, for recipes, you guys know how it works, and of course, you're gonna to wanna to do that, that batch method. So uh, I guess finally, Corey, is there, are there any last comments that you'd like to say to my uh, viewers out there that either uh, are considering drinking kombucha, already drink kombucha, or, you know, we'll never drink kombucha. <laughs> I mean, for those that maybe have never drank kombucha, um, I would say, you know, go shop your local farmer's market. The, the rate that we are seeing kombucha grow on a local spectrum seems hardly recordable um, but it seems that this trend you know that people are are starting their own little nano breweries similar to what we started about a year and a half ago uh, is becoming a rapid trend so go shop your local farmers market you know try what other people are doing try some other some other brands and you know we're always an open source even uh, you know, if you come to Maui, come visit our local farmer's market and, you know, we're happy to share with, share with you the flavors that we're doing. But, um, you know, the closing remarks are, you know, kombucha has so many common misconceptions. And I think as you educate yourself more and more and you become passionate about the foods that you put in your body, is really only going to benefit you know your overall health and that's what we really wanted to do with our company is empowering people in our community to you know making those positive choices awesome yeah you know i really enjoyed being able to come out to your nano brewery and <laughs> share this with my viewers and also more importantly you know share with you guys some inside information about kombucha so that now that you are more informed you know, than the next person out there. So the last question I have for you, Corey, is how can somebody get a hold of you to purchase your products? Now, I wanna let you guys know in advance that, you know, Corey's not here to be your kombucha expert to teach you guys how to, you know, make your own kombucha, although you can visit his website for informational resor resources, you know, and to learn more about kombucha. If you're not familiar with it, he has actually linked some very good articles and information about it. But I mean, he's basically here every day making kombucha and he doesn't have time to answer your guys' questions, unfortunately. But if somebody is visiting Maui or do live lives on Maui, how can they get your product and learn more about you? Yeah, so we have we have links on our website as all the places on Maui where you can purchase it. We're currently a self-distributed kombucha brand, uh, meaning that I go and deliver, you know, we make all of our products are made to order for all of our accounts around the island. So that's usually, you know, what I'm doing during the week. But, uh, you know, you can always follow us on Instagram for inspiring photos that my wife puts up um, on a pretty regular basis. And, you know, it's not always just pictures of our bottles of kombucha, but we, we do try to inspire people to live life to the fullest. And, that's part of our personal lifestyle um, and the community of friends that we hang out with and, and do things with and share meals with. So um, yeah, you can always follow us on Instagram and, and uh, check out our website, awakentea.com. Awesome, awesome. Well, I wanna thank you, Corey, for having me out today. Really appreciate it. I really enjoyed my time learning more about kombucha. I'm not quite a kombucha expert yet, but I sure as heck know a lot more about kombucha than I did before I walked in here. And you guys know, I mean, I spent literally more than half a day here filming this video, learning about kombucha. Now you spent, you know, probably, I don't know, half hour or a bit more than that learning a lot more about kombucha than most people out there. I definitely want to encourage you guys, if you ever come to Maui or you live on Maui, 
<laughs> Awaken tea kombucha, definitely the best stuff. I could definitely guarantee it. Mmm. I love that green one. Actually, I think the lilikoi or the ginger. Ah, they're all good. Get one of each if you see Corey at the farmer's market and tell him John Kohler sent you. In any case, I hope you guys super enjoyed this episode. Learn more about kombucha than any other video you guys ever watched. If you're not already, please subscribe to my videos and be sure to check my past episodes where I teach you guys how to live one of the healthiest lifestyles that I ever found. So once again, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com and until next time, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables and hey, drink some kombucha too. It's always the best. Aloha, this is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. Today I have another exciting episode for you and this episode is about one of my favorite foods in the whole wide world. Like they always ask it, if you're on a desert island, what one food would you